to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We welcome you today to the wonderful study of the book of Hebrews, the superiority of Christ is on display throughout the book of Hebrews, and we're so glad that you've joined us for this study. We want to encourage you to take just a moment and find your Bible, have it handy, as we're going to look to the Word of God together in the book of Hebrews. Also, we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit with them, attend their assembly, come to their worship service on Sunday or their Bible study on Sunday night and Wednesday. They'd be glad to have you for that. If you'd like to learn more about the local congregation or about God's Church and the plan of salvation, Christians there would be happy to sit down and study with you. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we want to encourage you in your study of the Word of God as well, and we offer several opportunities to help with that. Visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have all of our lessons, digital, video, audio, transcripts, study questions, uh, written material, just a vast library of good Bible study material on our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and we want to encourage you to check that out. If you'd like to have a digital copy of today's lesson or a hard copy, you can log on to our website, fill out a media request form, and we'll make sure to send that to you free of charge. And friend, as always, we want to encourage each of us to make sure that we've got our Bible, that it's what we're going to study and go by, and that we let God through His Word speak to us about how the Christian ought to live and what he ought to do. Today, as we're studying the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2 especially, the Hebrew writer is going to encourage these Christians who have, many of them, have left the Hebrew or Jewish religion that Christ is greater than and that especially Christ is greater than angels. And it begins in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, by showing that even in the delivery of God's law to us today, it's greater. Think about these words. Hebrews 1, I want you to notice verses 1 and 2. The Bible says this, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. And then he goes on to show that who through me made the world, through is the image of brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, who's seated at the right hand of God, and who has become so much better than angels as he has by name, Son of God, been greater than they. And so the emphasis again is going to show the greatness of Christ, but I want us to think about several things in Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2. How did God speak to people in the past? Well, the writer very clearly says during various times and various ways in the past, God used a variety of means to speak. For example, sometimes God would speak to them by the prophets. That is, God would speak through men, whether it be Jeremiah or Isaiah or Daniel or some other prophet, Amos, whoever it may have been. At times, God used the prophets to speak to people. There were times when God spoke to them through His special servants known as angels. Like with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, like with Abraham, God would send a message through the angels and He would speak to His people. Uh, with Balaam, God even spoke to him through a donkey at one time. God, in the book of Ezekiel and with uh, Elijah, spoke out of the whirlwind. What an amazing thing that would have been. And then there are times God spoke directly to the people then. But friend, here's what he's contrasting. In the past, 
God during a, a lot of different time periods spoke to people through a lot of different ways. How is God speaking to us today? God has spoken to us in these last days through His Son. Friend, when we think about God's revelation, when we think about the message of God coming to man today, how is God communicating with me and with you today? There's a lot of people who want to say that God sent me a special message or God sent an angel or God whispered this in my ear. Friend, here's what the Bible says. God has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Where am I going to find God's message for me? Where are we going to find God's message for us today? In the words and in the testament of Jesus Christ. John 16 verse 13, Jesus said, When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Luke chapter 24, it was promised to those men, you go to Jerusalem, you wait, and the Spirit will come from on high. Acts chapter 2, the Spirit descends upon them, and they begin to stand up and speak in other languages they've never studied. And that, that gift of the Spirit giving them that revelation is used in Acts chapter 2, and of course is used in the first century to get men and women the Word of God. Friend, here's what's wonderful. We have, God's revealed message complete today. Jude 3 says this. He says, Brethren, well, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you, listen to this, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That revelation, that period when the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles, it gave the once for all faith to God's people in written form of the Bible, the Word of God. Here's what we know. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, the Bible says this, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Through knowledge of God in the Bible, listen now, we have everything for life and for godliness. Friend, God's revelation is the complete, perfect Law of Liberty, James chapter 1, verse number 25. And so as we think about that message from God, how wonderful it is that we have the Bible. And this book that we know of as the Bible has everything we need to know God to get to heaven. This is how God is speaking to man today. When I open the words of the Bible and I read that in the New Testament, this is God's revelation on salvation, on how to live, on, on dealing with the issues of life for me and for you today. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him first acknowledge the things which I write to you. These are the commands of God. The written word by the inspired men in the first century. That's the Word of God. That's our message from God today. And as Paul would say again to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, all Scripture, the Holy Bible, the Scripture, is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, friend, as we think about the message of Hebrews chapter 1. How does God speak to us today? God's not speaking through angels. God's not speaking through another form. God has spoken to us through His Son. The life, the teaching, and the covenant of His Son is revealed in the New Testament, and that's God's message for us today. What a wonderful and powerful message that is. Now, he's then going to kind of trans, uh, transition into Christ being greater than angels. And what we've got to realize here is this. In the Hebrew mind, angels had a pretty high place uh, because of their work throughout the Old Testament, the things that they had done. And we've got to realize that angels played a prominent part in the delivery of that first Ten Commandment law. According to Galatians 3.19 and Acts 7 verse 53, the law was delivered 
by angels to the hands of the mediator, uh, Moses, who would take that to the people. The angels played a big part in the delivery of the law of God, delivered by angels to Moses. Now, God's new covenant, the greater covenant, it's even greater in who God sent to deliver it. God didn't have that delivered through angels. When God gave us the greater covenant, the new covenant, He sent His own Son to deliver that to mankind. And so even in its delivery, it's greater. And so He's going to show Christ is greater than angels. How is He greater? If you'll notice in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 4, He makes the point Christ is greater than angels, and then He tells us how that Christ is greater. And I want you to notice with me, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, look at what he says about Christ being greater than angels. Having become so much better, there's the idea, better than angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Well, what is the name? Christ is better than angels by name. Well, what is that name? Verse 5, Son of God. You are my Son today. I have begotten you. Angels are ministering spirits. They're servants of God. Christ is Son. The Son is always of greater name and higher than the servant. Firstborn. Verse number 6, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He is that when he brings the firstborn in the world, he says. And so he's the firstborn, the cherished one, as it were. Uh, again, the firstborn son would be greater than angels who are servants in the house of God. But friend, I don't want you to miss this. What name does Christ carry that makes Him greater than angels? Friend, there are people in our world today, and there are religious groups that will teach that Christ is not divine, that He is not deity, that He is not God. You cannot read the words of Hebrews 1 verse 8 and 9 and walk away with that false conclusion. In this context, we're going to read it, but in this context, God the Father calls Jesus God. Notice it with me. Hebrews chapter 1, look in verse number 8 and 9. But to the Son, God says, listen to this, God says to Christ, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Listen to those words. To the Son God says, Your throne, O God. The Father recognizes and notes that the Son is also God. Why is Jesus greater than angels? Why is the delivery of the New Testament law greater than the delivery of the Old Testament law? God didn't use angels to give it. God sent His own Son. And thus the Hebrew writer is then going to transition into application to that idea. What does it mean if God sent His Son, who is greater, to deliver the New Testament law uh, rather than angels under the Old Testament law? Watch the application in Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since this is the case, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now watch, for if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, every transgression and disobedience receives a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders of various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. The idea is this. What makes Christ greater? What makes the new covenant greater? How are we going to escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If under the old law, when angels delivered that, and it was spoken through angels, uh, if people who didn't obey that law, there was a retribution, there were consequences to that then, and it's the inferior law delivered by angels? How will we escape if we neglect the great salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, by those who heard Him, and was confirmed from heaven itself by the miracles that they did? Friend, the point is this. You've got, we've got, the superior law. 
Christianity, the new covenant, the testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is the greatest law ever given by God to man. It's what's in place today. And if we don't realize that and accept that, there's nothing else coming. There's no other way. There's no other hope. It's the great salvation. And friend, I want you to think about that for a minute. We, we can emphasize, no doubt, the, the need to listen and the need to obey that and the consequences of not doing so. But don't miss this statement. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Friend, I, I want us also to realize the greatness of that salvation. Why would you want to escape that? Why would you not want to accept the great salvation that comes through Jesus Christ? It demands uh, greater attention of us. We've got to pay closer attention than those are in the Old Testament. We've got to give the more earnest heed. I've got to listen more closely to God's message. It's the final revelation from Almighty God. There aren't going to be any more messages coming. This is God's final message to man today. There is greater consequences to those who disobey it. If every transgression and disobedience received a just reward under the old law, what about today? What's the greater retribution or consequences today? Friend, we don't want to harp on the negative, but listen carefully. If someone doesn't obey the gospel, that person, the Bible teaches, is going to be lost eternally. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want anybody to perish. God, want, God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. But we don't do anyone any favors by not speaking about the subject of hell. Jesus said there is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9, verse 44. There is a great place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, according to Matthew 25. And the devil and all his angels and the ungodly will be cast into outer darkness, into that place of eternal torment. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 11. And so there are more serious consequences today to not accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we say that because one can become a Christian and obey the gospel, and how wonderful that is. This salvation is also greater because it is identified as the great salvation, and there is great confirmation that goes with that. How can I be sure that this is the greatest salvation? How can I be sure that the law and the covenant and the teaching of Jesus that we have, that those are the great salvation? Well, the writer says in Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4, we've got confirmation to that. The Lord spoke it. His apostles spoke it, and God confirmed it by the signs and miracles and miracles and various gifts of the Holy Spirit. The, the miracles that we know in the Bible, that we read about in the Bible, Jesus healing the sick, the casting out of demons, the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on the water, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. What are the purpose of all those miracles? Friend, they are a big, like a big sign. Imagine in your mind a big, blinking, flashing sign pointing to something. It's so big, it's so bright that you just can't ignore what it's blinking at and what it's pointing at. Friend, that's the purpose of miracles. Miracles in the New Testament, when the Bible was being written, were designed to point men and women to a spokesman of God as a true, confirmed spokesman from the Father. And thus, we have that confirmed message of the greater salvation in our hands today in the Bible. It's the great salvation because it gives us the great victory. Victory over sin, victory over death, and victory over Satan himself. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse 14. What makes this salvation so great? Look at what we have victory over. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death, listen, that through death, he, Jesus, might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This is the great salvation because it gives us the greater victory. Victory over what? Victory over the enemy and victory over death. 
Friend, the enemy, Satan, has been working against man all, from the time all the way back to the garden. When he tempted at Adam and Eve and they ate of that forbidden fruit and sin entered in. And every man has succumbed to sin because of his own choices. That, that great enemy, Satan, has been overcome because of Christ and His covenant. And then we have the power to overcome death. These people that he talks about were subject to death and they had fear of death and there was no real hope over death. Not anymore. The Bible says in John 11, verse 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. Jesus said, He who believes in me, he'll never really die. Revelation 14, verse 13 promises, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. All who are in the grave will one day come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. So Christianity is so much greater because of the great victory. It's greater also because of the great sacrifice. Look in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 9. The Bible says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death, for every man. He says, I want you to look away from all these things that you're focusing on, on the old law, and here, see Jesus. He was made a little lower than the angels. He came in human form. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 9. He made a one time, he tasted death for every man. Friend, I don't have to suffer and die and uh, deal with the consequences of sin because of the great sacrifice Jesus made. Listen to these words. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 and verse 27 says, It's appointed a man once to die, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. I can't escape death. And the consequences of sin, which all have to deal with, are eternal separation. But then listen to Hebrews 10, verse 12. This man, Jesus, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, what makes Christianity great? Jesus took my place. He tasted death for every man. He bore our sins in His own body upon the tree. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. When He died, He overcame death and sin. Oh, death, where's your sting? Uh, the, uh, sin, where's the, the, the sting that you hold over man? And all of that has been defeated through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And then, of course, we point out as well, we have access to the greater relationship with God. Look in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse number 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. Now watch this. For which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. Again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children God has given to me. We are brethren, we're children, we're Christians, we have a relationship with God through Christ. And what a wonderful picture that is of the greater relationship that exists with God's children, saints and Christians today. But friend, there's one other thing. As we think about Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, Christ being greater than angels and the greatness of our salvation, one other thing that I really want you to see that is so powerful in this context, and it's this. We have a greater help today under the new covenant. Look in Hebrews chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 16. The Scripture says, and again contrasting Christ with angels, For indeed He does not give aid to angels, but... He does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, He, Christ, had to be made like His brethren, that He might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of His people. Listen to this. For in that He Himself has suffered, being tempted, He's able to aid or help those who are tempted. Christ is not, God's not giving aid to angels, seed of Abraham, God's children today are receiving help. How? Christ was made just like me and you. Hebrews 4.15 says this, He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Christ came to this earth. He knows what it feels like 
to face temptation. He knows the uh, death and, and the things that go along with that. He's seen what it's like from our perspective. And having been here, having lived it, and having given us the Word of God and His example, friends, we have help. He, listen to these words again. He's able to help those who are tempted. Our temptation, our struggles, our difficulties that we face, friend, realize today there's help to be offered. That help comes through the example of Christ. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. That help comes through the Word of God, which is the, the picture of how Christ lived and what He did and how He overcame that. And then, of course, we can find help through prayer. Hebrews 4.16 says this, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. I can access the throne of God through Jesus Christ our Lord and help is offered for God's children. Friend, as we live our Christian life and as we try every day to walk in the light, no doubt along that way difficulties and challenges may arise and, and there may be things in our old life that try to pull us back. Let's realize this again. You're a part of the great salvation. Christianity and Christ is far superior to any life, any way of life, anything that you might do. Nothing is greater than being a Christian. Don't ever, ever give up on Christ and Christianity. The end result is going to be the salvation of our souls. If you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you today to become one. Do you believe in Christ as the Savior of the world? John 8 verse 24. Would you turn from sin in repentance and turn to God? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you with your mouth make the good confession unto salvation? Romans 10, verse 10. And would you do what Jesus said to be saved? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. We encourage you to join us next time as we're going to study Hebrews 3 and 4 together. And may each of us strive every day to live our lives in such a way that we bring honor and glory to Almighty God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.